I want to see if I sit here still and don't move. <laughs> if you guys are like, hey, hi, <laughs> hi guys, I'm Victor. Um, haven't seen you guys since last year. <laughs> Just saying. I got the new laws. I got the new laws. I got the new laws. I'm getting everybody in here. I thought I let everybody in saying I didn't let everybody in. Look at me. What am I doing? Oh, still joining. Okay. Hello, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy, happy New Year. <laughs> My New Year's resolution is to lose weight and get... <laughs> Hope everybody's doing good. I got the new laws, um, <clears throat> not attacking us the way that I thought they were. So not too upset here. Um, just so you guys know, just I'm letting other people get logged on is why I'm stalling a little bit instead of jumping right into the new laws. Just so everybody knows, does anybody have anything they want to bring up and address right away um, while we're still waiting for a couple of people to get on? <clears throat> Still letting people in. Nobody has anything? Okay, everybody's just waiting for me. Just wishing you the best up for the new year, Patty. We love you a lot. Thank you. I love you guys too. You guys are awesome. Um, so looking at the legislative updates for 2023, um, we have some changes in language trends, affordable housing mostly, uh, fair housing, ADA, and collections. I mean, they really... <laughs> put us some things in and I'm still letting people in. So just bear with me. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, reusable screening reports. So that's AB 2559. It creates the ability to have a reusable tenant screening report under certain conditions. A reusable screening report is a report created within the last 30 days Hold on, still letting people in, sorry. Um, it's a reusable screening report that is credited with created within the last 30 days by a consumer reporting agency at the expense of the applicant, okay? Um, made directly available to a landlord at no cost through an application process or provided through a third party website. That website must be in the business providing reusable tenant screening reports and must comply with all state and federal laws. The report must state the name, contact information. Still letting people in, sorry. <laughs> um, that credit report must state, I lost my place, sorry. The name, contact information, and verification of employment, last known address, results of an eviction history check, and per, per, state the information, which the information is current. Landslurs, who's, hold on, okay. Landlords who elect to accept the reusable screening report may require that the applicant attest that there has been no material change in the information on that screening report where landlords accept the report, a landlord may not change the screening fee or allow fee to access the report. I'm gonna make this real simple for you guys. If a tenant shows up and they are applying for a property and you ask them for their screening fee and they hand you a credit report that is less than 30 days old, say thank you. And now you can't charge them anything to run their credit, do a background check or any of those things, okay? No expense to the tenant. So that's what that all comes down to. No expense to the tenant if they provide you with a credit report that is within 30 days old. Okay. Um, do not pertain to us. Does anybody here do anything with hotels, motels, etc.? Because why read the law if it doesn't apply here? Um, during COVID, during COVID, um, a lot of the hotels and motels specifically in LA, had to, when they were closed, remember, we were all on lockdown, so hotels and motels were closed. They opened their doors to the homeless to get them off the streets because of the government. They made them, asked them, whatever you want to call it. Um, 
AB 1991 makes it so that people that open their hotels and motels to the homeless population during the COVID pandemic, those people that were there over 30 days didn't create a tenancy. Okay, that's what that bill is all about. It's to help them actually be able to evict those people if they didn't get out. Um, also, <laughs> this one's a good one. I was shocked. Have to say I was shocked, but then it just goes to show me how much control the government is looking for. Pay attention. AB 252 puts floating home marina rent cra craps. <laughs> yeah, they're rent craps, all right. They're now putting rent caps on marinas for people that dock their boats there because they could be living in the boat. Make sense? Floating marinas now are rent capped in certain areas, a uh, 3% increase maximum. Okay. On marinas, they're rent capping marinas. Holy crap. Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> I got to think of where else people live so that I can wrap my head all the way around this because I totally brain farted that people live in marinas. Just saying. Didn't even think about it. Um, manager training for mobile home parks is going to be a requirement going forward that starts by May 1st of 2025. Anybody that's managing a mobile home or recreational vehicle park is gonna require the Department of Housing and Community Development adopt and implement regulations and require at least one person acting as manager or assistant manager per mobile home or RV park to receive training. The initial training must be between six and eight hours long and provide an end of the year examination every two years thereafter. So basically they're making um, mobile home parks and RV parks um, take training so that they know what they're doing. Um, and that requirement will take effect uh, May 1st, 2025. Um, domestic violence termination of tenancy. Um, SB 1017, and you guys need to pay attention to this one, okay? Creates a right of civil action against a landlord who violates laws related to domestic violence. Currently, a tenant can terminate their tenancy with a 14-day notice to a landlord where they or an immediate family member claim to be a victim of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, human trafficking, elder abuse, a crime that involves bodily injury or death, crimes that, oh, I lost my place, that involve exhibition, brandishing weapons, or crimes that use threat of force, Landlords will be liable to a tenant in a civil action for denying the tenant the opportunity to terminate their tenancy. So if they say they're a victim of domestic violence or any one of those things that I mentioned, brandishing weapons, exhibition, great bodily injury, death, any of those things, okay, you guys, you could be fined if you don't let them out of their contract. So pay attention. <laughs> um, actual damages sustained by the tenant uh, number two, statutory damages, if not less than $100 and no more than $5,000. Um, this penalty does not apply if the only documentation provided by the resident falls under subsection four, which provides documentation that reasonably ver verifies that a crime or an act listed in the subdivision occurred. The law also removed the word reputable from a reputable agency that hires a violent crime advocate. The bill requires judicial counsel to update their forms. Okay, I'm not going to get into it. So what they did is they added civil penalties. What is the effective date of AB 1072? 1072. Hold on, I'm looking for 1072. What does 1072 involve? 1072, I'm looking through everything. Somebody talk to me, what's 1072 involved? Cause I don't have them all memorized and I don't see it on my form. 
1072. That's not for collections. What's 1070 domestic violence? Thank you. I'm a blonde. Uh, domestic violence termination of tenancy. That's actually SB 1017. And that's in effect right now. Okay. These all pass January 1st. Um, they can self-certify if they're a victim, um, but we want them to provide a third-party documentation, a police report, um, something along those lines, or a message from, and hear me out, okay, a third party that's aware of the situation. In other words, um, maybe it's not law enforcement that they confided in maybe it's their health care that they're being abused mentally so it could be anybody that a third party provider that let you know that they're a victim of domestic violence look at it this way okay if i was getting my ass beat every day by my husband boyfriend whatever and I confided in one of my best friends what was going on and told her that I was going to come up with a plan of action to leave the situation and get away from him. Shouldn't my best friend have the capability to help me get out of my lease contract while I'm trying to run for my life? I get it. I get it and I don't get it and I get it. So <laughs> when you have somebody that claims that they're a victim of domestic violence, please try to remember how hard that is just for somebody to say out loud. It's not an easy thing to admit you're a victim of. Just saying, I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, not going back. So please, I beg you, try to be a little bit more um, understanding when something like that happens because emotions run very high everywhere. When you finally decide that you've had enough and you want to do something about it, the last thing you need is an overzealous property manager holding your foot to the fire. Just saying. Um, also, vehicle trends. Um, California has passed a lot of goals promoting fully electric electric vehicles by 2035, several years, they've made more attractive to, to consumers. AB 1738 will require the Department of Housing and Community Development to research and develop mandatory building standards for the installation of vehicle charging stations in existing multifamily dwellings, hotels, motels, and non-residential developments during retrofits, additions, alterations to existing parking facilities for which a permanent application is submitted. I'm going to make this real simple. They're going to make it so that we're going to have to um, start installing charging stations for tenants. Um, the Energy Commission's track uptime charging of stations um, installed after January 1st of 2024. Um, they can receive an incentive from the state agency or charge through rate payers. So you can actually charge your tenant for charging their station. Um, you can um, charge them for charging their car there. Um, but there's quite a few new rules in regards to electric vehicle trends. We're going to see them become much more mandatory in the near future. Um, another rule that affects us as landlords is AB 2791, and it has to do with the processing of writs, um, writs of possession. Um, it requires the sheriff or marshal to accept an electronic signature. Um, not a wet signature on documents going forward. So we should be able to get a writ to the sheriff's office much faster for you guys because they, starting 2024 next year, they're no longer requiring a wet signature on the document. It can be electronically filed. So what that means in my blonde brain is we can get those writs issued faster. Just saying. So that's a good one for us, you guys. Um, the new one I don't like and don't have a whole lot of information on yet is AB 1837. It's regarding residential foreclosures. AB 13, I'm sorry, 1837. Um, let me just read this to you, okay? 
1837 amends some of the provisions passed by Senate Bill 1079, which permitted bids, bids after a foreclosure deal for eligible tenant bidders and eligible bidders housing. The law adds requirements to the definition of an ed eligible tenant buyer by requiring the bidder to attach evidence that the tenancy existed prior to the recording date of the notice of default and that the tenant bidder is not acting as an agent of any person or entity purchasing the property and has not filed petition for bankruptcy from the date of the sale through the 45th day after. Patty, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that this new Senate bill will most likely allow tenants and tenant advocate groups, affordable housing programs to purchase the property before the general public does. Yeah. Um, compliance and language updates forms um, any so any notice to cure or quit, uh, pay or quit, perform or quit, no longer counts Saturdays, Sundays, or judicial holidays. Why there is no legal requirement in the code which requires this phase, there have been courts decide that the failure to provide this language in the notice itself to be problematic. While it is not clear in the law itself, it would be wise for conservative landlords to revere, to review their curable notices and include excluding Saturdays, Sundays, and non-judicial holiday or and judicial holidays on their curable notice forms. You guys, what they're talking about is remember a few months back, I want to say it happened in July of last year, July 1st, if I remember correctly, but I could be wrong. Don't hold me to that date, where the three-day expiration no longer counts weekends, holidays, judicial holidays. That verbiage has to be on a three-day notice to pay rent or quit for you to be successful moving forward right now, okay? That also needs to be on your curable breach of covenant notice. Got it? So it must say within three days, not counting holidays or weekends and judicial holidays, okay? That's got to be on your curable notice, not just your pay rent or quit. That's what that law is trying to say. Um, there's some changes in regarding to, hang on. Oh, I don't like that one. We're going to skip that. Um, AB 1096 is a change of term. You guys will love this one. Change of term means we can't use that term anymore. We have to use a different term, okay? Change of terms. We're no longer to use the word alien. We can't use the word alien. Um, the legislature intent is to remove the word alien, which denotes a person who is not a citizen or, or national of the United States from all California code sections as the term is considered dehumanizing. I got nothing. So we can no longer use the word alien when we're speaking about people that are not a citizen or not, not, not a national of the United States. We can't use alien, okay? No ETs, just saying. <laughs> Can we still use the term midget? <laughs> Are we supposed to call them vertically challenged? Hey, watch yourself. I'm only four feet, eight inches tall, mister. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. They're little people. <laughs> I'm kidding. Do you know of any low cost or free services for hoarders, including removing stuff? Um... Yes. Let me stop what I'm doing right now. In regards to hoarders, it's a mental disability. So you would start an eviction based on clutter. Um, you may have to get adult protective services involved to help you at the very end of things or through the process. Remember, it's a mental disorder and you're going to call it a pack rat because you're not a doctor. You can't diagnose a hoarder. So you have a pack rat 
problem. And yes, you can absolutely do something about it. Um, I'd start serving them with three-day curable breach of covenants to clean up the mess. Make sure you're going back in to re-inspect with a 24-hour notice. And you're going to want to do several of those before you um, do the actual notice to quit. And how many curables you have to do before you do the quit has to do with how the courts are going to look at your case. So what you need to do is contact your legal counsel and ask them, how many curable breach of covenants do I have to do for a hoarding issue or for a pack rat issue, if you will? Sorry, I used the wrong term. I'm not a doctor. Um, how many curable breach of covenants do I need to do regarding a pack rat before I can issue a quit? in the city of blank. Your attorney is gonna be able to answer that for you. Um, various, and the reason I tell you to do it this way is because they're in those courts every day with those judges, I'm not. So an attorney may say, oh, in LA County, you have to have five of those to be successful. In San Bernardino County, you could be one and done. In Moreno Valley, their courts require that you do it twice before you do the quit. It just depends on the judge in the court. So that's how we want to gear that particular issue, okay, is based on that, how the judges act in that court area. And the way you get that information is by asking your legal counsel. Sorry. <laughs> um, go back to a couple of more things. I have affordable housing laws and trends. We have quite a few. Um, Violence Against Women Act, regulatory agreements and compliance monitoring, tenant Tenancy credit reporting evaluation. I don't know if anybody here does affordable housing. You're welcome. Anytime that you guys, that's why I'm here. Does anybody do affordable housing? Because if so, I need to send you one, two, three, four, five, six new laws regarding affordable housing, all the way to pets in affordable housing. Okay, Belsi. The, um, shoot me out an email, even at Fast Evict, and I'll send you the new laws on for affordable housing. I don't have too many people that, um, and these are all written in simple English, Belsey, so you should be able to understand them. If you have trouble, let me know. The other thing that I want to bring to everyone's attention, and this is for household pets in affordable housing only, okay? Pay attention. Housing developments that are financed on or after January 1st, 2018, must allow a resident to keep one or more common household pets. The resident must follow acceptable state and local laws related to public health, animal control, and animal cruelty for projects financed after 2023, either by health and safety code or by credits. The law also permits for reasonable, reasonable conditions include but are not limited to policies on nuisance behavior related to the animal, leashing, not leasing, leashing, like a leash on your neck, leashing requirements, requirements to carry liability insurance coverage, limitations on the number of animals in a unit based on the unit size, and prohibitions on potentially dangerous or vicious dogs. Everybody got that? So new construction is going to allow them to have pets going forward. So anything built 2023 or after. Um, and Belsey, email me, I'll send you those. We have fair housing and ADA laws and upgrades and, and trends. Um, Watch out because the DFEH investigates violations of Fair Employment and Housing Act. So um, here we go. And this is the one that I want to tell you guys to watch out for because this one is bad. Okay. AB 2917, accessibility of internet websites. You guys, please pay attention because I've been talking about this one for like four years. Okay. Existing law requires that complaints upon violations of accessibility and construction must also be served upon the California Commission of Disability Assess. 
AB 2917 will now also require complaints on violations of website accessibility access to be sent to the same commission. The commission so also be tasked with the creation of toolkits or educational models that would educate businesses on the standards for accessibility and how to achieve those compliance standards. January 1st of 2024, the to address the violations in construction related to the parking lots, exterior paths, and travel because those are consistently on the top 10 for alleged, alleged accessibility defects. Um, the other thing that I could tell you guys to watch out for, and mind you, fair housing is in full force right now, is if you're advertising on the internet and you have a website where you have, and I'll give you an example, okay? ABC Apartment Community has its own website. We advertise our um, vacants on there. We talk about our community, things to do in the area. It's how we advertise. You do not wanna have any photos of people on your website unless it is a picture of yourself and you're identifying yourself as the broker or an employee and you have your BRE number or DRE number, I don't remember, for the Department of Real Estate or the Bureau of Real Estate because we keep changing it, um, to have that there, okay? <laughs> Listen to me. If you don't, and, and a lot of us use pictures of people in our advertising for our apartment communities. You know, we may have people riding a bike or, you know, just on a bike ride it, it for a photo in our advertising community. It's discrimination against someone that's disabled. Got it? You have to be very careful when you put people in your advertisement if you're not advertising a specific person. Hi, I'm Patty. I'm the property manager. This is what I look like. Here's my BRE number, blah, blah, blah. If you have photos to advertise, as an example, and you have a picture of a family holding hands, walking through the courtyard with their backs to you, um, it's discrimination against people that don't have children. Got it? If you want to advertise that you're near a bike path, put a picture of a bike, but don't put any people in the photograph. Understand? Keep people out of your advertising. Because if you don't include all races, then you're discriminating. Got it? If you don't include pictures of people with disabilities, then you're discriminating against people with disabilities. Understand? So if you don't have a picture on your website of someone in a wheelchair and someone walking with crutches, you're discriminating if you're using pictures of other people. Make sense? Please stay away from that. It's bad, okay? And the easy fix is don't use pictures of, don't use photographs, including people in your advertising. It's that simple because you have to include every demographic, every race, every everything. You probably also have to include LGBTQ to be in complete compliance. So why bother? Just remove photos of people. Okay, um, the other one that I want to throw out there, because this is a good one, is access to restrooms based on medical conditions. You know how sometimes that we say, well, oh, I'm sorry, our public use. If you have a condition, you have to allow it. And that's uh, AB 1632. Businesses open to the general public for the sale of goods that have a toilet facility for its employees must allow access to persons with el eligible medical conditions during normal business hours. And even if that restroom is not normally open to the public, failure to grant access may subject the business to a fine of $100. Eligible medical conditions include Crohn's disease, ulcer ulceractive colitis, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome for people using an autostomy device and other medical condition that requires immediate access to a toilet facility. 
Employees are not subject to discharge or disciplinary action for violation of this law that that employee acted contrary to its express policies. So pretty much it's going to go after the business owner, not the employee. But yeah, you have to allow them to use your restroom, even if it's not open to the public, if they have a medical condition. Um, they're changing a little bit of DMV license and ID cards. That's AB 1766. California law previously established that persons who could not provide satisfactory proof of their legal residency status in the U.S. as authorized under federal law were permitted to obtain a restricted driver's license. That's AB 1766 amends this law to include the issuance of identification cards. Additionally, on this law, these federal restrictions license cards currently restricted license bear the image of DP or IC. Okay, so if you see an ID card, and I'll tell you, it used to say federal hold. Okay, now it also can say DP or IC. Um, that lets us know that they're not a legal American citizen quite yet. Um, discriminate because of that. So once the law is enacted and these licenses will remove these features and instead they will provide a statement. Lastly, no government agency, law enforcement agency or commercial entity or other persons shall disclose information maintained by the department for the purpose of immigration enforcement. So even if you know that they're not a legal citizen because of what's on there, you can't call them out on that, okay? Um, the next laws go into co collections, uh, co-signer and consumer contracts. This is Senate Bill 633. Huh. Pay attention, folks. Senate Bill 633 amends existing translation requirements for co-signers to consumer contracts and leases. Senate Bill 633 states that every co-signer who does not receive money, property, or services, regardless of whether they are married, are required to receive a copy of a particular notice stating the potential consequences of co-signing for a consumer contract. This extends protections to married individuals previously unprotected. So what they're saying is there's a new disclosure now for co-signers letting them know um, that what their consequences of signing the contract would be. So in the event that there was a default, it goes into depth that they could have an eviction on their credit, they could have their wage garnishment. So it's a disclosure for the co-signer letting them know what the consequences are if they don't um, do their part and pay their rent if the original tenant defaults, et cetera. Um, there's new laws regarding wage garnishments. Um, existing law allowed for garnishments to take the lesser of 25% of the individual's disposable earnings for 50% of the amount um, of disposable earnings exceed 40 times the state or minimum hourly wage. This reduces the percentage garnished to the lesser of 20% of disposable earnings or 40% of which the earnings exceed 48 times the state or local minimum hourly wage. This bill will protect a larger portion of the debtor's paycheck and will go into effect on September 1st of 2023. Remember I told you guys it's gonna be harder to get wage garnishments in place and it's not gonna be as easy, et cetera. This all has to do with that. Um, renewal of judgments. Existing law provides for judgments to last for 10 years and be renewable every 10 years. And judgment creditors were entitled to 10% of principal interest annually. Senate Bill 1200 amended these rules by limiting the renewal period and interest for certain judgments. Under the new law, any judgment entered for personal debt, that's what we do folks, personal debt where the judgment award is 50,000 or less, may be renewed only one time and the renewed judgment is allowed for five years instead of 10. 
Additionally, personal debt judgment and renewals under $50,000 entered on or after January 2023 will accure interest at 5% per annual and personal debt judgments over $50,000 will continue to accure interest at 10% and will be renewable for 10 years. So if your tenant owes you more than 50,000, you can renew for 10 years, okay? And you can charge 10% interest over that time period. If it's less than 50,000, you can only renew that judgment for five years. So original is 10 and then five behind it. Not as bad as I thought it would be. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Biden's falling off a bike. I missed that one. Sorry. What happens on the properties, units, apartments where pets are not allowed if the tenant brings a support pet? Um, as long as it wasn't built in that time period, you're probably fine. Um, they're not support pets, they're emotional support animals. And there's some very interesting laws in regards to that. And if you're in LA County, I wouldn't implement them right now because it's too easy for them to call retaliatory because of COVID. So if you have unauthorized pets in a property in LA County, as nice as I could say this, keep your head down and your mouth shut, hang on. Because <laughs> as long as that moratorium's in effect, I can't do anything about unauthorized pets. We have to wait for the moratorium to expire. And please take note, an attorney let me know that they could do 30-day extensions indefinitely. All right, now I'll start with the questions and I'll do my best to answer them for you guys, okay? Anybody have anything? Here we go, Anna. Do you or anyone else here know the Zillow request to apply process works? Are the applicants truthful with the info on the application? Also, is there an issue if you get lots of applications and you only accept one? Do you have to reject the rest or will Zillow or what exactly happens? Never used it, just wondering. Let me, I'm thinking about this. I'm bent over in my chair and I'm thinking. So you have two options, okay? You can either say that you take your applications first come first serve, which is what most of corporate America does. And there's a reason why we do it that way. Okay, so first come first serve would whoever applies first, you write a date and time and that's your first application in line. You process it if it's complete. If you don't accept completed applications, you didn't accept that application because it wasn't complete. You take the first person in line, you work that application. It's either approved or denied. If it's denied, you take the next person in line. If it's approved, you cancel everybody else that's in line. That is how first come first serve works. It is what the guideline of fair housing implements to help avoid any discrepancies regarding discriminatory issues, okay? So first come first serve is the best business practice. If you're not doing it that way, you are making yourself susceptible to fair housing violations. They wrote a guideline to help keep everybody out of trouble. So if you're not doing it first come first serve and you're doing it another way, you and I should have a conversation to make sure that you're in compliance with fair housing's guidelines because they, let me say this. What the law says when screening an applicant is that the landlord can pick the most qualified applicant. That's what the law says, okay? But us as landlords may start screening those applicants and use unethical practices to determine who's the best candidate and who's not. And that's what gets us in trouble, okay? <laughs> so as nicely as I could say this, first come serve is the best business practice, hands down. It eliminates a lot of 
fraudulent discriminatory accusations. Leave my statement at that. <laughs> so that's why Fair Housing implemented it as a guideline. It is not the law, but it is a guideline to help stop all of the um, discriminatory issues. It just helps put things in perspective a little bit better. Um, so as far as Zillow and all those other places and working with those people, I don't know about the Zillow process or how it works. I would say get involved with your apartment association and utilize that. Um, at least with them, I know their, their goal is to help you as the landlord. I don't know what Zillow's goal is. <laughs> so I don't know if I trust them. And I'll leave that at that. About rent increases in the state of California, any updates, especially in LA County. In LA County, I'm gonna tell you again, don't increase your rents. Um, we're still under a moratorium and I just wouldn't do it. Outside of LA County, <laughs> Orange County, San Bernardino County, Riverside County, San Diego County, Ventura County, Kern County, Inyo County, rent increases are allowed. They are not allowed in LA County right now. In fact, I wouldn't do it. Um, and some people will say they are allowed, they're not allowed. And this is me going back and forth with you, okay? For a certain period of time, we were told, oh, you can do them in LA County in incorporated cities. You can't do them in unincorporated cities. Look, 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 look. The reality is <laughs> it's all what a judge decides on their interpretation of the law. What we are finding in LA County is if you did a rent increase, the judge turns his nose down at that. So with that being said, in LA County, um, <laughs> Our law firm is now asking to see a tenant ledger and asking when the last rent increase was in LA County before we do a three day or start an eviction because we're going to most likely ask you to remove the rent increased amount on the notice to proceed and go forward. I said most likely, I didn't say it was a requirement. It depends on what city it's in, you understand? But at this point, our law firm is erring on the side of caution. Even if the rent is half of market rate, what the hell? Yes. Yes. To answer your question, yes. I get it. I know it sucks. But on the other side of the fence, and when I have to undo it to keep you out of legal stuff, it's a nightmare. I know you want to, <laughs> I know we need to, but now is not the time. Talk to me at the end of January and I'll let you know if they're gonna extend it for another 30 days. If they don't extend it for another 30 days, then you most likely can do an increase on February 1st. But until that happens, stay clear, okay? <laughs> don't do it. Okay, I'm going backwards so that I can make sure I get questions answered. Sorry, you guys. Um, about rent increase in the state of California, uh, no in LA County, no. What about increases in the state? Any updates, especially in Sherman Oaks? Not in LA County, don't do it. Ventura County, Orange County, Inyo County, Kern County, San Bernardino County, Riverside County, San Diego County. You can do rent increases for the most part, not in LA. Just don't do it, it's a bad idea. <laughs> Hi, Anna. Um, rent spree. Thank you, Hilda. Hilda knows her stuff, guys. <laughs> Rentspree.com has some good features. Yes, it does. Um, as far as credit screening, credit reporting, and things of that nature. Um, LA County incorporated cities are allowed. Possibly. It depends on what your legal counsel's willing to argue and what they know they're going up against based on if their case is going to be heard in the Long Beach Courthouse, in the Norwalk Courthouse, in the, in the Stanley Moss Courthouse. So it has to do with how the judges are ruling in the courthouse that your case will be heard in. Bottom line, is there a separate insurance for pets or is it included in renter's insurance? Thank you. It's separate. Pet insurance is separate. 
It is not part of your renter's insurance. You also need to have coverage for a pet if they have a pet. And it's usually an additional liability protection clause. Okay. The LA County, County moratorium clearly says rent increases do not apply in unincorporated cities, but I get what you're saying. It depends on the judge. Bingo, you got it. I know what the law says. You know what the law says. We all read it. We all understand it. But at the end of the day, we don't get to implement it. A judge does. So it depends on how that judge interprets that law as to how your case is going to go. Make sense? And I'm with you, man. I'm like, no, that's not what the law says. It's not what the law says. I want to do this. That's not what the law says. But I also don't want to go through a case law case to prove my point. I mean, let's say it this way. How much money do we want to spend to prove that we're right? Yeah, go to sleep on that one. How much money do you want to spend to prove that you're right? I don't want to spend any. <laughs> I want to watch somebody else face plant and then I'll make my decision on which way I'm going to go. <laughs> Hi, I have a stipulated judgment against my tenant. He's supposed to leave in a few weeks. Yes. My surveillance cameras have caught him whistling in a sinister way. Like I've got something in store for you. Yesterday, a guy in a suit and a briefcase came to visit him for two hours. I'm getting very paranoid. What can I do to protect myself if he doesn't leave on the days he's supposed to? Who am I talking to? Let me go see, because I'll tell you what's going on and what's happening. I, I bing, got this figured out. As soon as you said, they had somebody meet them in a suit. <laughs> Yes, you have a stipulated judgment. He will most likely vacate the unit, but I don't know. So I'm assuming things here. He may have made an appointment with an attorney to talk about habitability issues or something that he's going to try to sue you for civilly after he vacates. How do you combat that? Make sure your insurance policy is current. Make sure you have coverage for wrongful eviction. Make sure you have coverage for loss of rents. Make sure you have coverage for blah, 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 blah. Whatever else your agency can upsell you on to cover your asset to the best of your ability. You do that through your insurance policy. I can't protect you and say, hey, go do this and hey, go do that. It's your insurance company that protects you. So in the event he vacates as agreed on the stipulated agreement, and then you get served with a lawsuit regarding habitability issues or God knows what they're going to say, then <laughs> see how I know habitability issues, then you turn that lawsuit into your insurance company to see if they will assist you. If they won't won't help you with the matter, then you can go to your legal counsel and ask them to help defend you. Not a problem. If your insurance company handles it, hit the easy button. Most likely your insurance company is going to pay them off to settle outside of court. Has no bearing with you. Got it? Keep your insurance current. It's what protects your asset. Habitability issues in his answer were already addressed. Good job. Make sure you keep the invoices because he may be looking for a rent credit from the time you were notified about the habitability issues to the time they were repaired. And if that's the case, then that's the case. I want to sue this guy so bad. He's been a pain in the ass for three years gaming the moratorium. You know what? I've learned in my lifetime, if you're really good and you follow all the rules, God himself will initiate karma. And really good, you get to watch. That happens on the wage garnishment. That happens on everything else that comes after the eviction. Um, 
the reality is I know you're mad, but just get them out of your house, get your property back. That way you can reboot, reload, sell if that's what your intentions are, re-rent if that's what your intentions are, and then combat that later because he's going to come back after you probably in the form of a lawsuit that served to you. And I strongly suggest that the first thing you do is contact your insurance company. Once they tell you that they're not going to represent you in the matter, then go to your legal counsel. I will tell you this. If you go to your legal counsel first, your legal counsel will tell you to file a claim with your insurance company first. <laughs> if they won't help you, then your legal counsel will step in and help you. But the process and procedure is to you contact your insurance company first whenever a landlord is given a lawsuit. Even if it's on a disposition of security deposit, call your insurance company because if they handle it, easy button. <laughs> um, you want to make sure that you're covered to the best of your ability. You want to make sure you have a tenant policy in place and not a landlord you want a landlord policy. In other words, you don't want to be paying for personal belongings to be insured because you don't have any personal belongings in that house. You just want it basically on the structure so that you're covered on the structure, you know, fire, whatever coverages you have there. And then your liability coverage, you want to make sure that that's pretty good. Okay. And then um, loss of rent coverage is something you can ask for. Wrongful eviction is something you can ask for. And ask your agent if there's anything else that he would suggest that might help you with your investment property. Do not let them know that you're evicting a tenant currently. Do not let them know that you have any problems right now. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Just call them because you spoke to someone that's helping you manage your investment property. And they suggested that you call your insurance agent and make sure that you have all the coverages that you could possibly get to help protect your investment. Got it? <laughs> We want to play dumb sometimes. <laughs> and anytime you file a claim with your insurance company and they call you and start asking you questions, I always say this. Oh, the tenant called me and told me there was a problem. I immediately called this restoration company. Here's their name and phone number. I don't have any other information except the tenant called and reported it on this day. And this is who I called. Do you know why? It's the claims adjuster's job to find a way to deny the claim. It's their job. If you say the wrong thing, the claim's going to be denied. Do you know what to say and what not to say? I don't. I leave that to my restoration company and I play dumb. Oh, yeah, the tenant called me on this date at this time and I immediately called this restoration company. Here's their name and phone number. They're handling the issue for me. If I can be of any other service, please let me know. It's that simple. Pass the buck. I don't know what questions not to ask, what questions not to answer. I don't know how they're going to hang me up on a technicality and what my policy says. So I'm going to keep my mouth shut and let the professional that deals with insurance companies every day handle the matter. Hope that makes sense. Does anybody have anything else? If you got something, let's talk about it. Patty. Yes. Hi, it's Arlene. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, I, I know that you've always told us to be aware of um, the RSO LAHD people, but I just wanted to mention that I just got this email a little while ago that on January, I don't know here, just says January 23, oh, January 18th at 6 p.m. They're going to be having a live webinar for landlords to discuss Good. Um, emergency renter protections updates. So. <laughs> Remember when I told you they could, they could extend the moratorium every 30 mm -hmm. days in depth? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that kind of paint the picture? Yeah, well, it says here that the local emergency will expire on February 1. This one we'll hour see. webinar will include question and answer session. Okay, and we'll see. I hope it does. Oh, I hope it does. Mm -hmm. And 
if anybody wants to attend that, please sign up and attend it so that you can stay current on what's happening under RSO. <laughs> and then I saw somebody else sent a message. Do you have to accept online applications? No. Allie, are you going to ask me a different question about that? <laughs> Because no, you do not have to accept them online. You can put on your criteria that all applicants must turn in applications to the leasing office in person. Patty, I have a question for you. Yes. Okay, I uh, heard that if you are renting to a Section 8, then that's a federal uh, money you're receiving and therefore based on the fact that uh, marijuana is not allowed from stand view of the federal you can deny them from using marijuana if it's a section 8 tenant i'm kind of confused can you please shed light into this yes i can and i'll try my best okay California has ruled marijuana use as being recreational. It's no different than buying beer at 7-Eleven. Okay, everybody understands that. So people can have marijuana just like they have beer in their refrigerator or whiskey in their pantry. Understand? It's just as legal. Okay. When it comes to federal law, federal still holds it as a, I want to say it's a class one felony, but I could be wrong. Okay, but it's something like that. It's a drug felony. Because it's federally funded and the federal government is the one paying those funds, the chances of you not allowing marijuana use in a community that's on Section 8 is spot on because it's federally funded. It's only a matter of time before the federal government makes marijuana legal on a federal level. I can also tell you <laughs> that magic mushrooms you know, shrimps have been made legal and they can get them at some dispensaries. And the reason that they had to make it legal is so they could do more drug studies on it. They can't do drug studies on an illegal substance. So they have to legalize it so they can do drug studies to see how it would help people. And in some instances, especially with psych, psych I'll try again, I'm having a blonde moment. Psychiatric care, they are finding that micro dosing of magic mushrooms is offering relief to the patient. So they are trying to do more research on that. So don't be surprised if magic mushrooms now is completely legal in the state. It, it, you watch. <laughs> Okay, just saying, but that's my take on that as far as that goes. Let me go backwards. My surveillance cameras, habitability issues already addressed. This guy's so bad, he's been a pain in the ass for three years. I got that, okay. The wording, that wording is not in law in like included in insurance policy eviction protections. I'm not sure what that is. Um, he hasn't paid rent in three years. What credit? <laughs> I love you. Um, coverage for wrongful eviction, loss of rent. What else? We talked about that. Do you have to accept online applications? I hate Zillow. No, you don't. No, you don't. You do not have to accept applications online. You can tell them that they must apply in person and give them a place of business to do so. I'm sorry, our office doesn't process online applications. That easy. Anybody have anything else? 
Has Daniel mentioned what is going on with lawsuits against the county and the city? Um, no, actually, I will reach out to Dan and ask him what's going on with that. I do have a um, webinar coming up with them on animals. <laughs> emotional support animals and therapy animals in your residential dwellings. So we reach out to him this week and see if we have any with them. Section eight, wife vacating out the husband with the violence. Who will pay me the rent and to whom do I return the deposit? Does she have a saying she was affected by if so you have to allow her this contract with 14 days gives you saying she's vacating she's only responsible for 14 days of rent those what i'm saying <laughs> okay so jail wife says i'm a victim of domestic violence um, need to vacate this <laughs> 14 days they owe the rent even if they vacate rent for 14 days from the day they notified you okay i'm sorry i was so they only owe 14 days of rent and they have to give you a 14 day notice, okay? And police report something along those lines showing that there's been domestic violence and she owes 14 days of rent and then, then is off the hook, but she must vacate. And then um, from her deposit, you can deduct for damages, things of that nature and rents that were previously owed. You cannot go forward, no advance rents. Termination of tenancy uh, is 14 days when there's domestic violence involved. I hope that answers that question. And you, you can take that 14 days of rent out of the security deposit in the event that has to happen. Anybody have anything else? If you're currently in litigation in LA County, I strongly recommend and suggest that you speak to your attorney about letting go of the money and just seeking possession. But your attorney will be best to advise you on that, not me. It is definitely something you may want to consider. Stop the bleeding. <laughs> Get the property back. <laughs> Since the tenant is leaving, he still has to let me in to fix stuff, right? Yes. Um, yeah, if the tenant's moving out and you serve 24 hour notice, um, but if they're really desperately trying to get out, I say, leave them alone. <laughs> what are the chances of them messing that stuff up again? <laughs> but, um, if you're referring to that potential lawsuit that may be going on, don't fear the unknown. We don't know who that person is. He might be suing me. Yes call your insurance company don't tell them anything that's going on with the property just tell them that you talked to your financial advisor and they suggest that they contacted you to make sure that your insurance coverages were current on every aspect of your investment property it's play dumb give no information take whatever they give you okay <laughs> Wrongful eviction and loss of rents is a loss of rent coverage. I'll tell you guys right now, I've used that twice on my insurance policy. It's awesome. Awesome. Loss of rent coverage. Um, I evicted a tenant, uh, went to the property at lockout, found my kitchen counter in my fireplace. Ugh. Yeah. So um, they did quite a bit of damage, ripped cabinets off of walls. They were pissed I evicted them. I called my insurance company. My insurance company came out there. It took them about seven months to do all the repairs of my property. New carpet, new paint, new garage door, new kitchen cabinets, new flooring in the kitchen. I mean, they did a number. Um, 
it took them about six, seven months, I want to say. I'd have to go back and look at my records to get all that work completed. So during that time frame, I had loss of rent coverage. So they paid me what the tenant's rent amount was monthly until the work was completed. That would be loss of rent coverage. And worth it. All right, anybody have anything else or I'll end this for today? Oh, I saw some. Thank you. Thank you. Don't be afraid to be sued. That's what you have insurance for. Just call them and make sure that your policy is updated to the best of its ability. And if they don't offer you all these coverages, start shopping for new insurance. Just saying. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? You're going to find a better deal with more coverage? Hey, nothing wrong with that. All right, you guys, you have a great week. If there's anything that you need, please reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to help you. Stay safe. <laughs> Error on the side of caution. Use your fogging techniques. <laughs> okay, bye everybody. Have a good one.